Welcome to My Vaccine is Jesus. Today's discussion is in the Teaching the Rabbis playlist and is entitled Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, addendum number 4. So I got this recent comment from the older initial video from a Ted Ming 3515. You can go on with your gibberish forever. It's mostly about not seeing a forest for the tree. It's laughable because of the way you make your emphasis on the state of virginity of someone who lived thousands of years before you. The simple question for you, can you determine the state of virginity for a young girl, woman, simply standing next to her and looking at her? I'd say in modern days, the final word is ultimately with the gynecologist, not you. That's for starters. Now, what's funny about this is I'm responding to quote-unquote Rabbi Tovia Singer's argument regarding the use of words and what these words mean by inspired authors of the Old Testament scripture. So it has nothing to do with that point. See, the idea is Rabbi Sanger and myself, we both believe the Bible is true. The Old Testament's true. I obviously also believe the New Testament's true. And Mr. Singer does not believe the New Testament's true, but we both believe Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 is true. The issue is what does the word mean? (laughs) So he's missing that point. So that's laughable. No, it's laughable that you don't get that I'm just responding to his argument. So I guess uh, Ted Ming 3515 would have a problem with Mr. Singer as well. Secondly, ancient folks, including Greeks, were also much more sophisticated than were accustomed to think of them. As a result, there were actually multiple meanings attached to the word parthenos. Homer, who knew classical Greek a lot better than you, used this word also in the meaning of marriageable daughter and also as young married woman. I'll take his word for it. It suffice to say that Homer, along with other ancient Greeks, not being stupid, also understood that one can't automatically presume the state of virginity of a young woman girl simply because of her age and her youthful looks. Again, that has nothing to do with the point. The point is, Mr. Singer believes the Bible's true. I believe the Bible's true. We both believe Isaiah was a prophet. and Those are inspired words from God. <laughs> okay, so it has nothing to do with uh, Homer. Uh, or these points he's bringing up. Therefore, the use of a certain word cannot be the ultimate determinator of someone's physical state as related to one's sexual experience or their absence. The usage of the word can in many situations be a presumption of someone's purity, not a statement of physical certainty. All that's true, but it has nothing to do with uh, the point of the video or Mr. Singer's point. As for those Jewish translators, you never know. Maybe they were using Parthenos the way it had been used by Homer. Who is there to tell otherwise? You're right, and maybe they weren't. Did you talk to them on the phone recently? Eh, no, and neither did you. Besides, understanding of all languages, and Greek is no exception, do go through stages when meanings of certain words acquire different shades of meanings and sometimes acquire a meaning that is completely different as compared to its original one, obviously very true. One of the examples is the meaning of the word gay in English. A mere couple of centuries ago, actually not even that, Uh, earlier in the previous century, added an entirely different meaning as compared to these days. So what? Should I presume while reading an author from the 19th century or the early to mid 20th century that he is talking about a member of LGBT community if he uses gay in his book? Of course not. Besides, it's all besides the point, whether virgin or not. The prophecy given to Ahaz through prophet Isaiah is a prophecy about something to happen in his lifetime, in the lifetime of Ahaz, which is roughly 700 years before someone called Christ. It's not a prophecy about something to happen 700 years later after Ahaz. Go F yourself, you stupid child. What a sweetheart. My response, so you curse me because of a disagreement regarding what ancient Jewish Second Temple period scribes meant when they translated a particular Old Testament Hebrew word into Koine Greek and I'm the child. By the way, Batula is routinely rendered in the Septuagint as Parthenos. So according to the Septuagint translators, not Homer, different author, Parthenos used in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 means virgin. And here's the English concordance of the uses of Betula, Genesis 24, 16, first use, Exodus 22, 16, Exodus 22, 17. I'm not gonna show you every single usage in the Old Testament, but Genesis 24, 16. Notice Parthenos is used twice, once referring, both of these to Rebecca, once referring to um, Betula, which will be the second Parthenos, and the first, by the way, referring to Naara, which is another Hebrew word meaning young woman. Exodus 22, 16, Parthenon. Exodus 22, 17, Parthenon. So notice, again, Betula is routinely rendered as Parthenos 
in the Koine Greek. And sorry, but Parthenos was used in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. You're also not very observant. The direct prophecy to King Ahaz of Isaiah chapter 7, verses 11, 16, and 17, thee, thou, thee, thy, and thy, second person singular pronouns are used, probably relates to Isaiah's son, Shirjashub, whom the Lord instructed Isaiah to bring with him. The prophecy to the entire house of David in verses 13 to 14, ye, you, ye, and you, second person plural pronouns, refers to the promised divine Messiah to come in the future. Thus, this individual to be born of a Parthenos is seemingly the same individual as the seed of the woman promised back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. By the way, the Koine Greek Septuagint rendering of Genesis 3, 15 refers to him as spermatos, sperm, seed. Can you see the connection? So the point I'm trying to bring up is there's this Parthenos having a child, and again, it seems that refers to a virgin, and a virgin can't have a child. You need a man. That would be a miracle. Well, by the way, there's a seed, a sperm of a woman, a male child to be promised in the future, who's going to defeat Satan. Hmm. You surely seem to be one spiritually blind, arrogant, rude, and hateful individual. I pray you repent one day and come to the feet of Lord Jesus, yod Vave, in the flesh, the Son of God, explicitly mentioned in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. The divine Messiah, my Lord and my God, and your Lord and your God. So let's look at some of this. There's Isaiah chapter 7. We'll look at verses 10 through 17. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorst shall be forsaken of both her kings. The Lord shall bring upon thee and upon thy people, upon thy father's house, days that have not come, from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Assyria. So let's look at these pronouns here. Notice, just like I mentioned in my comment, uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 11, thee, 16, thou, 17, thee, thy, thy. Those are referring specifically to Ahaz, second person singular. And interestingly, notice Isaiah chapter 7, verse 3, the Lord instructed Isaiah to do something when he met Ahaz. Then said the Lord unto Ahaz, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shirjashub thy son, the child, at the end of the conduit of the upper pole in the highway of the fuller's field. Huh. Why is that? Could this child that the Lord told Isaiah to bring with him when he met Ahaz be the child that's being referred to here? This child? The child? Possibly, right? And again, the point is the pronouns. Why? Because notice in verse 13 and 14, ye, you, ye, and you are referring not to Ahaz, but referring to the entire house of David. I'm going to show the verse. I think it's verse 6. But the two wicked kings, right, the wicked king of Syria and the wicked king of Israel were planning to defeat Judah, defeat Jerusalem, kill Ahaz and his lineage and place a puppet ruler on the throne and thus end the house of David. So doesn't it appear there might be two prophecies happening? One involving Ahaz as an individual, right? Verse 11, verse 16, verse 17, and another for the entire house of David in verses 13 and 14 involving the Emmanuel to be born of the Alma, the Parthenos. And Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, this is referring to the serpent, the woman is later named Eve, and between thy seed, the seed of the serpent, and her seed. Women don't have seed. The man plants the seed. So if a woman's going to have a seed, doesn't that suggest this is a woman going to have a child without a father who would be a virgin? Huh. It shall bruise the head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And there it is. Spermatosaftis, her sperm. Hmm. And then again, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? 
Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? That's Lord God. What is his name? Lord God, yod heh vav -Heh. But wait a minute. And what is his son's name? If thou canst tell. So notice there is a divine son of God, which means there's a father and there's a son, and they're both divine, but there's only one divine entity, God, but there's a father and the son. Here it is in the Old Testament. But our friend can ignore all of this. His response, I don't hate you against smiley faces, cracking up faces. Why should I? I don't hate people who are just plain stupid like you are. There are always issues in multi-level translations. I know it because I've worked as a translator myself. Oh. In classical Hebrew that came to us largely unchanged mainly because it was a dead language for millennia used primarily in religious ceremonies only, Alma means young woman, yes, young unmarried woman, and Betula means virgin, okay. The problem is, in a traditional society, wouldn't a young unmarried woman also tend to be a virgin? That would be the argument. They are different words. Young unmarried woman, Alma, Betula virgin, Naara young woman, could be married or unmarried. It's kind of funny that you choose to believe some obscure scribes who allegedly, now isn't this funny, so he's to be respected because he's a translator, but the scribes chosen at the second temple to take the Hebrew Aramaic text and translate them into Koine Greek since that was the language of the time, the language of the people, right, during that Greco-Macedonian time. And to not think that, you know, maybe these people knew their stuff, that's ludicrous. They're just these obscure scribes. That doesn't seem reasonable to me, especially if you're going to brag about you're this wonderful translator now, you know, 2,000 you know, plus years after the fact, who allegedly didn't have any religious bias. That's ridiculous. There, this was in the second or third century before Christ. These were the scribes of the temple. You know what, you know what, they, what they did have a religious bias. You know what their bias was? They were believing Jews. Okay, they surely weren't Christians. It's ridiculous, who allegedly didn't have any religious bias because they were doing all the translations, allegedly, before the time of Christ. That's all where all the evidence is. But you don't believe people for whom it has been a language they assimilated practically with milk of their mothers. What do you mean? People today? You just said the language has been dead for 2,000 years, basically. So, no, I'm going to believe those translators more, that they knew what the words meant. So when they translated Alma, into Parthenos, which means virgins, that means in context it's referring to a virgin. And again, think about it. There's a young unmarried woman having a child, and they're going to call him Emmanuel. Huh. Why would that be a sign of anything? Why would that be unless it's miraculous, right? Because if she was a young unmarried woman who was not a Batula, she was wicked. She was, so, there, so there's going to be this wicked, what, whore girl who's going to have a child out of wedlock, and that's going to be this sign, I guess. Well, I guess that's what he thinks. Um, what are you going to say to the first-year English language student, let's say, from Guatemala, who will be trying to persuade you there is absolutely no difference between lady and broad? No, they, they, they do be different. Broad, again, has kind of a negative connotation, doesn't it? The etymology of the word parthenos suggests proto-Indo-European for breast, Apparently to denote a young female with protruding breasts, or in other words, a female fully firmed in terms of her puberty. In itself, it doesn't refer to her state of virginity, only to her gender and her age. This is all what he's saying. Thus, one of the meanings used by the ancient Greeks themselves, a marriageable maiden, also a newly married woman. All what he's telling us. On the other hand, alma in classical Hebrew is used with no reference whatsoever in terms of a woman's sexual experience, simply to denote a young woman, a young unmarried woman. Yes. Thus, it can be used in relation to a virgin, but it doesn't have a meaning of a virgin. Okay, but we'll see how it's used in context in the Old Testament. And yet again, in traditional societies, especially in ancient Israel, if you were a young unmarried woman, if you were an alma, wouldn't it be assumed that you were also a batula, a virgin? Because if not, you were wicked. And if that was found out on your marriage night, they would stone you to death. Okay, I guess that means nothing. Hundreds of thousands of Jews paid with their lives for refusing to accept the distorted meaning of their language as it had been taught to them by representatives of the church. Okay, if anyone murders anyone, that's evil. That's against the commandments of Lord Jesus. That's against Christianity, right? And what we're told to do is spread the gospel. And if people refuse to accept it, we dust 
the, uh, we shake the dust off our shoes and move onwards, okay? Tens of thousands of them were burnt alive by the Spanish Catholic Inquisition precisely because they knew the difference between Amal and Batula, okay? That, think about it. That's why. So we, you know that. So you know that the reason these were murdered, which is evil and wicked and not Christian and against the commandments of the Lord Jesus, was specifically because they knew the difference between Anma, young and married woman, and virgin, when a young and married woman in a traditional site would be a virgin. So that's ridiculous. Now, if your car mechanic tells you that you don't have to worry about your carburetor because he already checked it, you may think to yourself that what he really means is the carburetor in the car of some your distant descendant who would be born centuries later. Okay, ultimately it's up to you. Yeah, that's an amazing comparison of, to what we're talking about here. It's your car. If you don't want to come to your senses in which to indulge yourself in strange, twisted logic, Godspeed, you can drive your car in any direction you want. I am having a different drive. now piss off, basically, right? Along with your car, and then a link to a YouTube video. Huh. Here's the YouTube video. Le Magnifique, 1973. On va perdre un temps fou. And I surely can't speak French. And evidently that means where he wasted some time was. So this is something that our friend here thinks has, you know, some meaning to him related to our discussion. So forgive me, I can't figure it out, but God bless him. My response, you surely can't help the sophomoric insults, can you? And I didn't say you hate me. I said you seem to be hateful, which means full of hate, which you certainly do. At least he does to me. Maybe I'm wrong. Not so much the scholarly linguist you make yourself out to be. By the way, those who insult strangers in such a manner tend to have deep-seated psychological emotional problems, which is true. I hope you get some help with that. In fact, every use of Alma in the Hebrew Bible refers to a young unmarried woman who is virginal in context, I'll show. Fact, Batula is routinely rent, translated as Parthenos in the Septuagint, which I already showed. I'm not going to show more. By the way, let's look at this. This is the first usage of Alma in the Hebrew Bible. It's in Genesis 24, 43. Now, if you remember, the first use of Batula in the Hebrew Bible is Genesis 24, 16. Right, Batula, virgin. By the way, also in Genesis 24, 16, Na'ara was used, I believe for the first time, referring to a young woman, not necessarily related to whether she be married or unmarried. Okay, obviously, if she's a young married woman, she's not going to be a Batula. But a young unmarried woman should be a Batula. Regardless, there's a Septuagint underneath, and you'll see the first util utilization of Alma in the Old Testament is Genesis 24, 43, referring to Rebecca. That's the same Rebecca who in Genesis 24, 16 was referred to in the Hebrew as a Na'ara and an Alma. So notice Rebecca is the individual where Alma is first used in 24, 43, where Betula is first used in 24, 16, where Na'ara is first used in 24, 16. And interestingly, the translated in every one of those usage of the three distinct Hebrew words used Parthenos. In fact, murder is a human problem, not just an inquisition problem. It is found throughout the Hebrew Bible, many times being perpetrated by Jews and other Hebrews. Anyone committing murder breaks the explicit commandments of Lord Jesus and is not fallen Christianity. Just think of the murder perpetrated by atheist to communism in the last century. Who was behind that? Hmm, I wonder who that was. Surely not believing Christians. In fact, the overall context of Isaiah chapter 7 through 11 supports a prophetic connection to the future divine Messiah. Your problem, another one, is you are spiritually blind like those Isaiah was sent to in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. In fact, the divine Messiah was explicitly prophesied to come and be physically killed by his own people just prior to the second destruction of Jerusalem and the second temple. Genesis 49, 10 through 11, and Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. So if Lord Jesus wasn't the promised divine Messiah, he most certainly was, there never will be one. But you refuse to accept this. So Lord God will grant you your desire and your spiritual blindness will continue. There's nothing more to say. So let's look at these references here. All right, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you, notice, Second person plural, this is assigned to the entire house of David. It's a little different, right, than what we saw to the uh, uh, a sign given to Ahaz, right? Uh, Behold, a virgin, an alma, a young unmarried woman, a parthenos, shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which, by the way, means God is with us. That's Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 8, and he shall pass through Judah, he shall 
uh, overflow and go over. These are talking about Assyrian invaders. He shall reach even to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. So this Emmanuel is someone very important. He's the individual, it appears, who owns the lands of Judah. So again, if this was some young unmarried woman who was non-virginal and had a child who was, what, a whore, a harlot, that woman has a child and that child in such a circumstance is going to be the owner of the land of Judah? Okay, you believe that if you want. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Huh. So Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, they're talking about a son being born in the future. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, they're talking about a son being born in the future. Oh, this has nothing to do with nothing. Even though in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, his name is Emmanuel, and Isaiah chapter 8, verse 8, he, that Emmanuel owns the lands of Judah. Hey, let's look into this sign, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Oh, he's going to have the government upon his shoulder. He's going to be the ruler. I'm not going to show verse 7, but it basically says he's going to be the son of David, and he's going to have the throne of David forever. How can a man have an eternal throne. It seems like he would almost be immortal or something. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, Il Gabor, the Everlasting Father or the Father of Eternity, the Prince of Peace. And by the way, the Messiah is referred to in Daniel chapter 9 as the Prince. And Il Gabor is only used one other time in the Hebrew Bible. That's in Isaiah chapter 10 referring to Lord God. And wonderful is the name of the angel of the Lord from uh, Judges chapter 13, verse 18. Huh. So it's going to be the angel of the Lord, the mighty God, born as a human. He's going to be the Messiah, the son of David. Fascinating. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. This is talking about, if you go back to Isaiah chapter 10, I think it's verses 20 through 23, something like that. It talks about basically the people of Judah leaving the, their land, being kicked out of their land, it appears, and coming back later, and it appears that the kingdom was taken from them, etc., and the tree of David was chopped down. Look at Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem or the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Huh. See, Christianity connects all this easily to explain who this is, and our friend thinks it's all just nonsense, of course. I wonder why. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 to 12, all right? Because remember what he's saying, if you can speak this language with your mouth as your mother's milk, you understand everything about it. And I guess that means you also understand all the spiritual connections, really. Let's look at what happens in Isaiah chapter 6. We looked at Isaiah chapter 7 and chapter 8 and chapter 9 and chapter 11, and I referred to some things from chapter 10. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 6. This is a vision that Isaiah had of yod heh in the temple at that time. And basically, he, was, he stated, I'm a man of unclean lips, living in a people of unclean lips, right? And then a seraphim, this angelic spirit being, takes a coal from off the throne, puts it in his mouth, and Lord God tells him, now your sin is purged and your lips are clean. And he said, this is Lord God speaking to Isaiah, go and tell this people, right? The people of Judah, the people of Israel, the people with the unclean lips, who by the way, could speak Hebrew as their mother's tongue and mother's milk. Hear ye indeed, but understand not. So they're gonna hear things, but not understand them. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. They're gonna see things, but not perceive them. Make the heart of this people fat. They're gonna have a fat heart. Make their ears heavy. They're gonna have heavy ears. And shut their eyes. They're gonna have shut eyes. Lest they see with their eyes. They're not gonna be able to see. It's always see spiritual. They're not gonna be physically blind. They're gonna be spiritually blind. And hear with their ears. They're gonna be spiritually deaf and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Now you can say, well, why would God not want them to understand? See, God wants everyone to understand. But some people, even if they see the truth right in front of their face, will refuse it because they are unwilling to unlearn something. They're unwilling to admit right, what they believe taught to them by men is wrong. They don't really want truth. They want to be right. And being right means if I was taught something before, I have to cling to it. Now, if what you were taught before is the truth, that's great, but what if it's not the truth? See, Lord God has mercy. He gives you an excuse. 
So you can say, oh, I didn't see, I didn't believe, I didn't hear, I didn't understand. It's not my fault. I just couldn't see it. You made it somewhat obscure to me, Lord God. Now, Lord God knows it doesn't matter. That type of person spiritually will refuse to accept the truth. Like our friend here. Let's say if somehow we can prove to this individual, no, that means virgin in that verse. Do you think he'd be come a Christian and see and believe upon Lord Jesus as his Lord and his God and get baptized? Of course not. He'd find another excuse and another excuse and another excuse and another excuse and another excuse. Continuing. Then said I, Lord, how long? So how long are the Jews going to be this way? And other people, obviously. You know, the Jews are humans. Humans are like this. And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate, and the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. I don't Some of that kind of sounds apocalyptic. So, I don't know, to the end of the world? So certain people are going to be like that to the end of the world. They will refuse to see the truth. See, if you really want the truth, if you really love and trust God, and don't have your preconceptions and your biases, and, and let Scripture speak to you, I believe that God will allow you to see the truth. And if you really don't, you just want to believe what you've been taught, right? And cling on to that and insult strangers and whatever, God will allow you that as well to give you sort of an excuse that, oh, I just, I just couldn't see that, God. You made it somewhat difficult for me. Genesis chapter 49, verses 10 through 12. This is when Israel is giving blessings to his sons, and he gets to his fourth son, Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. The scepter is what the king would carry. So the kingdom will not depart from Judah. Now, the kingdom did depart from Judah with Nebuchadnezzar nor a lawgiver from between his feet. So what happened afterwards, right, with when they, when, the, when obviously when the Jews came back after 70 years in captivity, right, but under the Babylonians, under the Medo-Persians, under the Greco-Macedonians, under the Romans, they did have some degree of self-rule. So the scepter shall not depart from Judah, right, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh, which means peace, which is a reference to King Messiah. I'm not going to show you the references, but you can look into ancient Talmudic Jewish sources, and they understood this was King Messiah. So when King Messiah comes, so what does that say? King Messiah is going to come after the kingdom's taken from Judah, and right around the lawgiver is finally taken from Judah. When was the lawgiver finally taken from Judah? Well, that's when the second temple was destroyed and Jerusalem was completely destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. So what does that mean? That means the Shiloh, the King Messiah, is going to come right around then. Hey, when did the Lord Jesus come? Right around then. And unto him, Shiloh, King Messiah, shall the gathering of the people, the people of the world. See, the purpose of the Bible isn't a revelation meant solely for the Hebrews and for the Jewish people. No, it's meant for the people of the world right? God chose Abraham, right, to plant his seed in that lineage so that his divine son, the one we saw in Proverbs 34, would enter humanity, right? We saw that basically in Isaiah 9, 6, right, to become the Messiah, the Shiloh, the peace, because the peace isn't between men and men. The peace is between man and God. We need reconciliation between man and God, right, because of what happened in the garden, and we see the seed of the woman, the sperm of the woman, is going to rectify that, right? Anyway, uh, continuing. Binding his foal unto the vine, and his ashes colt unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. He's going to have these bloody clothes. By the way, the binding the foal and the ass's colt references Zechariah 12.12, 12, this humble Messiah entering Jerusalem. And that obviously references Lord Jesus entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. His eyes shall be red with wine. In the book of Revelation, he has eyes that burn like the fiery flame. And his teeth white with milk. And the book of Revelation, out of his mouth comes a two-edged sword of truth, by the way. But notice here, notice this prophecy. This is very important. King Messiah is going to come after the kingdom's taken from Judah 
and right around the time the lawgiver is finally taken from Judah. And that's when the Messiah was going to come. Well, that's already happened. That happened prior to A.D. 70. Oh, when was Lord Jesus crucified? I don't know, right around A.D. 33? Is that the only prophecy? No, Daniel chapter 9. This is during the captivity. 70 weeks. That references 490 years, right? When the 12 spies were in the land of Canaan, 40 days, since the people listened to the 10 and not the 2, right, Joshua and Caleb, for every day those spies were in Canaan, there was one year they had to wander in the wilderness. So a day is a year. So a week is seven years. Seven weeks is 490 years. 490 years are determined upon thy people, the people of Judah, and upon thy holy city, Jerusalem. Notice this, to finish the transgression, the what transgression? The transgression that goes all the way back to the serpent. To make an end of sins. An end of sins? When does sins enter? Oh, with the serpent. To make reconciliation for iniquity. Reconciliation for that sin. And to bring in everlasting righteousness. Wow, this all of this was going to happen. 490 years subsequent to that time. And that again lines up almost exactly with the time of Lord Jesus. And to seal up the vision and prophecy, the vision, the whole vision, the whole revelation was going to be sealed up, the, all the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, you could say, oh, that was going to be the second temple anointed, the most holy place. The problem is you're going to see that second temple is going to be destroyed. So the most holy is God. God's going to be anointed. That's that son of God who took on flesh, Proverbs 34, Isaiah 9, 6, etc. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, Messiah Nagid, the Prince Messiah, shall be seven weeks, 49 years, and three score and two weeks, which would be 62 times seven years. So notice how it doesn't say 69 weeks. So it appears it's going to be seven weeks, 49 years, and then a break of some time, and three score and two weeks, 62 times seven years, the street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. So Jerusalem's going to be rebuilt. And after three score and two weeks, so after, remember, there's this seven-week period, 49 years, and then a, a space of time, I guess, and then a separate 62 times seven-year period, shall Messiah be cut off, killed, but not for himself. Oh, so the Messiah is going to be killed, but for others please. And again, going back, I don't know if I mentioned this, but going back to Genesis 49, he's in the, his clothes are the blood of grapes. He's going to be in bloody clothes because he's killed. And the people of the prince that shall come. Now the prince that shall come is the prince Messiah. So his people are going to be the Jews. So the Jews shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So the Jews are going to destroy Jerusalem and their sanctuary. How does that happen? Because they didn't believe upon the divine Messiah, right? They didn't know the time of their coming, right? Why was the first temple destroyed? Because of idolatry. Why was the second temple destroyed? Because of hatred. Because they hated Lord Jesus and wouldn't accept the divine Messiah. And the end, therefore, shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he, this Prince Messiah, shall confirm the covenant with many. Wait a minute. The covenant with many is the covenant to the peoples of the world, right? All the gathering of the people of the world that we saw back there in Genesis 49.10. So if you're confirming a covenant with many, does that mean you're ending the covenant with few? Does that mean the new covenant is being confirmed and the old covenant is being closed in some way? For one week, oh, there's that 70th week. Remember, there was seven, there was a total of, right, 49 weeks, right? Forgive me. There was a total, forgive me, of 70 weeks, right? 490 years. And that 70 weeks was broken into seven weeks and then 62 weeks. Out of that 69 weeks, there's one more week, seven more years. And in the midst of that week, in the middle of this seven-year period, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Ah, that, that would mean what? The temple's destroyed. The sacrifice ends. And for the overspreading of abomination, she shall make it desolate even until the consummation, which is thought to be end times. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Wow. So there's a total of 490 years. There's going to be seven weeks, 49 years, a break, 62 times seven years. And then this final week, final seven years, where the confirmation of the covenant with many 
is going to be made by the Prince Messiah. In the middle of that seven-year period of time, it appears what? The temple's destroyed. Now, isn't this fascinating? The Rome-Jewish War lasted from 67 to 73 AD, exactly seven years, one week. And in the very middle of it, 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. Yeah, I'm sure that's all coincidence too. So notice, the Messiah was prophesied in the Old Testament to come right around the time, both in Genesis 49 and in Daniel 9, same timing. After the kingdom was taken away and right around the rulership being taken away when the second temple was destroyed. Right? Right in the middle of this seven-year Rome-Jewish war. Please. So that's why I say that Talmudism, right, which is what our friend follows, I guess, right, this fifth century cult that rejects the Messiah. They call themselves Jews but are not but are the synagogue of somebody, right? That is a false religion. It's based upon lies. The Messiah you're looking forward to has already come. The peace is not on earth. The peace is between us and God. The only way you get to God the Father is the divine Son. Again, you see him in Proverbs 34. Notice this is all Old Testament I'm sharing with you. Our friend, yeah, and you can't help being illogical, can you? If you say that someone is full of hate, it most inevitably means that it is hate towards someone or something. You, in your turn, also didn't show yourself a very scholarly linguist, did you? If you did, show me where. If I have deep-seated psychological problems, you, dude, have very serious problems with your common sense and logic. The overall context of Isaiah chapter 7 verse 7 does not support a prophetic connection to the future divine Messiah. You, no doubt, imply Jesus simply because you say so. No, I just showed it. And he obviously, does he really know any of that stuff? No. I doubt it. It is a fact only in your deluded perception of it. Oh, okay. If I'm spiritually blind, he is, then you are simply dumb. Okay, I guess so So be it. Am I dumb? Hmm. Not anywhere in the Old Testament the word alma is used in virginal context. Stop lying. Hmm, oh, interesting. It's never used in a virginal context, ever. I'm a liar for even suggesting otherwise. Prophet Isaiah was Hebrew by birth. He was born of Hebrew parents. He spoke Hebrew as well as Aramaic. They were his native tongues. The book of Isaiah was written in Hebrew, not in Greek. All of that's true. If you trust your Septuagint translators, no, I trust the Second Temple Jewish Septuagint translators. Yes, I do. They're not mine. It is your problem. I trust the source. I, I agree. The whole point is, why did those Jewish scribes use Parthenos? They understood Hebrew. They understood Aramaic. They believed in yod heh They were not Christians. They were not those of the Talmud cult from the 5th century AD either, right? And they used Parthenos. I wonder why. Hebrew Tanakh is the source of all sources in terms of the Old Testament. I agree. It is the source for your Septuagint. It's not my Septuagint. It is for your King James and your NIV and your New American Standard and your every bloody else. You're right. It is. Yeah, it is. It's the source of, yeah, of course it is. That doesn't take away the Septuagint is meaningless. And they used, and these were Jewish scribes, and they weren't mine. And I don't know why this individual doesn't respect them. And that is what the source says in the book of Genesis, chapter 24, verse 16. I can't read Hebrew. But then he tells us what it says. Now the maiden was a very comely appearance of virgin. By the way, maiden is na'ara, virgin is betula. And no man had been intimate with her. And she went down to the fountain, and she filled her pitcher and went up. This is Rebecca. I mentioned this earlier. There are two Hebrew nouns used in this verse in relation to one and the same female. I mentioned this myself. Na'ara, which means maiden, and betula, which means virgin. Well, na'ara doesn't mean maiden. Na'ara means young woman, okay? Because maiden, I'm sorry, when I use the word maiden, that applies virgin. Maiden is a synonym for virgin. Uh, anyway, ancient Hebrews were sophisticated enough to have different words in their vocabulary to draw a distinction simply between maiden, should be young woman. So this translator, I don't, he shouldn't use the word maiden there. Maiden refers virgin, doesn't it? Suggest, forgive me, virgin. Maiden, maid, damsel are words for a young and married woman who would tend to be, right, a virgin. So I wouldn't say maiden. I would say young woman, yes. The verse is pretty specific in terms of showing that a particular female or maiden, I wouldn't say maiden, didn't have any intimate relations with any man, or in other words, she was betul or virgin. I agree. There is no no, even, I guess not even, a slightest hint of Alma being used in virginal context either in this verse or in their entire chapter. That's a joke. Or in the entire chapter? Well, guess what? Genesis 24, 43 uses Alma referring to the same woman at the same event. I mean, that's pathetic. So he's pathetic. He's pathetic. Okay, what he just said there is, it's, it's funny. It's just not true at all. It's the complete opposite. So in context, 
Na'ara is referring to a virgin, Betula means virgin, and Alma is referring to a virgin. Alma means young and married woman, Na'ara means young woman. Unless you're fanatically dumb enough to refer every time you're Septuagint, which is the translation of the source. No, I don't need that. It's understanding language and words, and I thought this person was a scholar of some kind. He used to work as a translator, right? Anyway, uh, but that's your problem, not mine. If you desire to be dumb, let Lord God grant you your desire and you continue being dumb. Adios. Now, I just think it's interesting. First of all, in context, Naara, referring to Rebecca, Betula, referring to Rebecca, and Alma, referring to Becca, all are referring to a virgin. Okay, that's a fact. and that So therefore, it shows Alma was used in context for a virgin, just like Naara was there, by the way. And the Septuagint translators, two to three centuries before the time of Lord Jesus, who were Jews, who obviously were learned men. They were chosen by the temple to take the, you know, well-respected, honored, revered Hebrew Aramaic text and translate them into Koine Greek because that was the lingua franca of the Jews and the, you know, important people of the time. They didn't get a bunch of schmucks to do so, unbelievers. And those non-schmucks used in this issue here regarding Rebecca, as I showed, use Parthenos for Naara, Parthenos for Betula, and Parthenos for Alma. Maiden, again, an unmarried girl or woman, a woman or girl who is a virgin. That's what maiden means, my friend, in English. And by the way, I believe I show it that Naara is used at times to refer to a non virgin. So that's not a maiden. So I would not use maiden ever for na'ara personally. I would use young woman. So you don't think your tone in your previous comments had been hateful. Go F yourself, you stupid child. Hmm, very first comment from you. Now piss off. I guess we just have a difference of opinion regarding what being hateful entails and can agree to disagree. I'm sure he's a sweetheart. I have never claimed to be a linguist. On the contrary, you have been the one seemingly teaching me all about the classical Greek used by Homer. My understanding was that Homer's works were from the 7th to 8th century BC, while the Septuagint was compiled in the 1st through 3rd century BC. You would think a language might change a bit over 400 to 700 years. I, I guess we'll just have to take your word for it, of course. I forgot guess in my thing there, typo. God bless it. Anyway, um, isn't it incredible we have to go back to Homer to see what these people meant when they used Parthenos and whenever they used it, it referred to a virgin. Oh well, my interest is scriptural interpretation. I am surely no expert, but I do note how you don't even respond to the verses I brought up. Notice, no response to Proverbs 34, no response to uh, Genesis 49, no response to Daniel chapter 9 because he can't. Although I'm sure he would respond in a way and call me all kinds of names, etc. Finally, you bring up some scriptural points. Thanks for that. By the way, the manuscripts of the Septuagint we currently have, which are older than the Hebrew and Aramaic manuscripts we currently have, were made by Second Temple Jewish scribes. These individuals obviously understood the ancient languages and the contextual meaning of the words involved better than both of us and anyone else currently alive. No, I mean, that's pretty obvious. Not anywhere, here's a quote from him, in the Old Testament, the word Alma is used in virginal context. Stop lying. This will be fun. The first use of Betula in the Old Testament is Genesis 24, 16, referring to Rebekah. The first use of Alma in the Old Testament is Genesis 24, 43, also referring to Rebekah at the very same event. Thus, the context of the use of Alma in Genesis 24, 43 is referring to the Betula Rebekah of Genesis 24, 16. Interestingly, the first use of Na'ara is also Genesis 24, 16, again referring to Rebekah, as you mentioned. Care to apologize and admit you were wrong here at least? Of course he doesn't. He just attacks and insults. The remaining usages of Alma in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 2, verse 8. The Alma here seems to be young Miriam, who tradition teaches was seven years old at the time, sister of Moses. You don't think she was a virgin? So the young unmarried woman, girl, seven-year-old, no, no, she was not a Betula. Psalm 68, 25, the Alma here were involved with a procession to God's sanctuary. You don't think they were virgins? Again, <laughs> weren't they be as sinless as possible? Again, you would think. So they were young and married women. I would assume they're involved with a procession to God's sanctuary. They were probably virgins. Proverbs 30, verse 19, the Alma here disappears out of sight, one interpretation, with a young man. You don't think she's a virgin? 
you know, a young man takes his virgin out of sight, maybe. Songs chapter one, verse three, the Almahi are those who are in love with Solomon. You don't think they were virgins? Again, these are y'all, all young unmarried women. Okay, so these young and married women are in love with Solomon. So you think Solomon's gonna be spending his time where with young and married women who aren't virgins. Again, you could debate these things. Songs chapter six, verse eight. The Almahi are those who are not Solomon's queens, right? These are married women having sex with Solomon and not Solomon's concubine, who are unmarried women having sex with Solomon. So therefore, what would be uh, the other group who are these Alma? Young, unmarried women, what? Not having sex with Solomon, and they probably would be virgins, come on. And then we have Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14, which is this prophecy, future prophecy, the entire house of David. And I showed the connection you know, via Emmanuel to Isaiah 8.8 8, and to the Isaiah 9.6 and Isaiah 11 verse 1. So if you don't think she was um, a Parthenos, oh, by the way, they called her a Parthenos. Okay, think what you want. Please note all of these usages of Amah in context could refer to virgins. The ones that are obviously virgins are Genesis 24, 40, 43, what you showed, and Song 6 verse 8. Again, the only group would be what? Young, unmarried women not having sex, virgins. The ones that are pretty obvious, virgins, Exodus 2, verse 8, you know, a seven-year-old girl, and Psalm 68, 25, young unmarried woman involved with the procession to the sanctuary. The others could surely be debated, but there is no indication they were not virgins. Again, in ancient Israel and other traditional societies, non-virginal unmarried young women would be stoned to death if this truth was found out. So which option seems more likely? Considering the usage in Genesis 24, 43, Song 6, 8, Exodus 2, 8, Psalm 68, 25. Personally, I like the interpretation for Alma as maid or maiden or damsel, which are all synonyms for a virgin. So again, I think in traditional society, a young unmarried woman would be a maid, maiden, or damsel, right? You would assume, hey, we're not gynecologists here. We don't know what the, the, the bed sheets are gonna look like on her wedding. Again, if the bed sheets didn't show tokens of her virginity, she could be stoned to death. So I think young women and their families would be protecting the maiden head, right? The hymen, maiden head. That's maiden refers to virgin, and he uses it for na'ara. I guess Koine Greek didn't have many synonyms for virgin, as na'ara in Genesis 24, 16, betula in Genesis 24, 16, and alma in Genesis 24, 43 were all rendered as parthenos. Interestingly, there are usages of na'ara which in context refer to young unmarried women who are not virgins. That's why calling it maiden like our translator does, I think is a translation mistake and inappropriate. For example, certain verses in Deuteronomy 22, I'll show those and then we'll be done. Oh, before showing them, final point. This is what's really funny. My video was a response to Rabbi Tovia Singer who claimed the early church was a liar for using Parthenos in Matthew 1.23, hearkening back to Isaiah 7.14. But you agree with me that Parthenos was used in the Septuagint in Isaiah 7.14. You just debate its meaning, considering the use of Alma in the original Hebrew text, which he's allowed to do. So St. Matthew was not a liar. So Tovia Singer's wrong. That was my point of my video. St. Matthew was not a liar. The early church was not a liar. So either Tovia Singer's the liar, or he just didn't know that, and if he doesn't know this, what's he talking? He used St. Matthew Parthenos in Matthew 1.23, which he did since that particular Koine Greek word was used in Isaiah 7.14 of the Septuagint. And our friend here doesn't even debate that. It is a fact that many Old Testament references in the New Testament come from the Septuagint and not from the Hebrew manuscripts. Judge that how you wish, but the early church was not a liar. You would argue with the meaning of Parthenos in Isaiah 7.14, of course, which is surely your prerogative. Finally, you actually agree with me on the main point of the video. Thanks for doing so. Now, getting back to Deuteronomy 22, verses 25 through 29 here. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, so notice she's not married yet. She's betrothed to get married later. So she's unmarried, but she's betrothed. And the man force her and lie with her then the man only that lie with her shall die, because basically he raped her. But now notice, she's no longer, subsequent to that, a virgin, is she, right? But unto the damsel, so notice this is after that, she's no longer a virgin. So I wouldn't use the word damsel, I would say, but unto the young woman. Thou shalt do nothing, there is in the damsel, the young woman, no sin worthy of death, for as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so in this manner, for he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. 
So if you look at verse 26, that damsel there, in context, is no longer a virgin. So notice, like I said, in that verse 26, but to the young woman, we la na'ara, in the young woman, la na'ara, that particular na'ara is no longer virginal. So I wouldn't use damsel. The King James translators used damsel in that verse. So she was a damsel in verse 25, and you can argue verse 27, when they were calling her a damsel at that point, was she still a damsel? And again, damsel is a synonym in English, at least, for maiden, for maid, for virgin. So she's no longer a damsel in verse 26, because 26 in context is referring after this man has raped her. She's no longer virginal. So that's what I was referring to. Verse 28, if a man find a damsel that is a virgin which is not betrothed and lay hold on her and lie with her and they be found. So notice this Na'ara in verse 28 is a virgin. They specifically state she's a virgin. She's not betrothed. She's a young woman. So I could, damsel's appropriate in English, right? But notice right now she's been raped. Then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father 50 shekels of silver and she shall be his wife because he hath humbled her. He may not put her away all his days. You know, I guess maybe he didn't rape her. doesn't really say one way or the other. He's forced to marry her, right? Uh, sounds great to me. Um, but notice again in verse 29, she's no longer a damsel. I, you know, because again, damsel to me is a synonym for virgin. So I would use young woman. So again, these are, and again, of the Omi Ha Na'ara. So I'm sharing two verses here or three verses or whatever the case may be. I guess it's two verses with three usages of na'ara as an obvious non-virginal by context. But notice you can't do that of Alma. And several of them, as I showed, are obviously have to be in context virginal and the others, you could argue it. So there was, by the way, some further back and forth with, between myself and this individual. But basically I kept stating my points, he kept stating his points and calling me an idiot um, uh, and illogical and piss off and F this and F that. And I, he mentioned gynecologist several more times as well. So I won't share with it, that with you because really no points were brought up. So hopefully that was uh, interesting, edifying to you and possibly even a bit entertaining. Amen.